And then followed by Lazarus, we'll have Lucia sharing some written work with us. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Andrew, for inviting me to this. This is a wonderful thing. I'm so glad I was able to do it. So this is a piece of mine that is part of uh, what I like to call um, my black market devotional propaganda. Uh, and by that, I mean it's a little slice of determinant, which is a, a French term, uh, French for hijacking, actually. Um, and it's a term where you take something like a, something out of advertising or a public service announcement, you take an image <clears throat> and you hijack it for a different meaning. So uh, I was walking one day, there's a little story, a little backstory to this one. I was walking one day to, the, to see Governor's Island, which is a tiny island on the tip of Manhattan. I'm in New York City, by the way, I'm in the Bronx in New York City. Tiny island on the tip of Manhattan. And there, it was uh, occupied by the Coast Guard. You couldn't go there, no one could go there, but they were finally opening it up. So they opened it up to artists because they wanted to start to make all of the uh, places there be art venues. So they opened it up to everybody to start giving out grants. And uh, I showed up one day and, I, and I'm about to cross the street to get on the ferry to go there and see it all. And I see this guy carrying these folded up boxes and they, it, it looked like the Coca-Cola logo and it said, to me, it said cop out. And I stopped, you know, I was on my way there and I had all these ideas for what I was gonna do. I'm on my way there and I see it and I was like, ah, oh, that's perfect. It just made me laugh. I was like, oh, wow. Like that's perfect, a perfect sentiment for what we do when we give in to advertising, right? You just sort of give up. You, you let them take control in a way. You give in to your own ideas and you just believe it. You buy it, you buy into it, right? So I was like, ah, oh, great idea. Wow, I wonder what I would do. And then I see this guy walking, walking, walking until he walks back to his Coca-Cola truck. So he was carrying Coca-Cola boxes and it didn't say cop out and it was just a delivery guy, you know. I immediately, my brain went ding, light bulb, <laughs> went straight home, grabbed a board and crafted the, the logo cop out out of their, their uh, font. At that time, you could not get their font. It was drawn out. I had to make it up. Um, you couldn't use the Coca-Cola font at the time. And I told everyone that, uh, saw this at first, thought I was going to be sued by Coca-Cola. Lo and behold, their font gets removed. Um, nevertheless, uh, I threw in this this guy at the bottom of it because to me, it seemed like a, a somebody throwing a big rock at a huge electric billboard to sort of break it, break that idea, break that notion. You know, so it's kind of the people taking back their own sensibilities and thinking for yourself. Don't, letting, don't let someone else think for you. Think for yourself. So um, that's uh, where Cop Out was born. We can go to the next one. So this is uh, uh, the original corporate takeover is the name of this one. I had the great fortune of being born on Columbus Day, which for a Puerto Rican woman is quite bittersweet, I gotta tell you, because growing up, you got this three-day weekend, so it was amazing. It's like three-day weekend for your birthday every weekend. Fantastic, wonderful, because no one teaches the, you the actual history of what's happening, right? So then you grow up and you learn the actual history and sort of the genocide of your people, and it's kind of a bittersweet moment. And uh, uh, again, sort of in that idea of uh, determinant and sort of breaking this notion of, of uh, advertising, I grabbed the Chiquita logo which Chiquita to me was a kind of diminishing term for Latin X women. So it really kind of got under my skin, let's say. So uh, I grabbed that logo and immediately for some reason, I don't know what it was, I was kind of fishing through the internet for images and I found these images of uh, a reenactment that was done of the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, Columbus discovering America. So immediately the two, I put the two together and that, that image was born. It was just another thing 
along with the cop out that I had to go home and Google to make sure that someone had not done before me because I couldn't believe that someone had not made that connection, but apparently no one had. <laughs> but what I love about it is that it's sort of this little history lesson and a little uh, a pill, a little bit of advertising that contains so much within it. But uh, so that's, that's that one. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. So this is Veil. Veil for me is a bit of a meditation on eternity. Now what it physically is, it, it is my wedding veil, actually. Um, I had a wed I was married, I no longer am, but I was married and I had this sort of gold embroidered veil. I, and I posted it up on my uh, uh, wall in my studio to paint. Um, uh, it, and what it became was a mandala. The act of letting go of painting the representational image that was before me, and instead just enjoying the making the marks it, themselves on the paint on the on the canvas. So it, it the act of it sort of flipped for me. And one of the things that I that I love most about and that I that I love most about painting, as I'm a, 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 a fine art painter that works in oils, is that I try to become, I work hard to become transparent to transcendency. So the, that idea being that you're not just looking at the image before you, but that image sort of speaks to you past that image. You see past the image that you're looking at to the eternal. And there's a favorite quote of mine by Joseph Campbell, um, the world of time is as if a veil thrown across the face of eternity, and we cannot penetrate it. So eternity is a dimension occluded from our existence by the veil of time. So that notion kind of blew my mind in the sense that here I was trying to paint this thing that was a veil. Actually, it, the physical nature of it is very transparent, but once you put it on a two-dimensional object, it's it's very sort of solid. So the, the challenge became trying to sort of break that and allow you to see sort of through it to sort of its eternal idea rather than just the representation of the image. And what's interesting about it is if you stand a bit away from it, even just on your computer screen and walk sort of from left to right, you can kind of sort of see the the shadows of it it looks like an actual veil that someone is is sort of holding up in front of you so that you can't see anything past it yeah, so that was uh that is there to me so this is overgrown i spent three months in ireland uh working on a project and what is the rule of murphy's law but if something can go wrong it will and everything and I mean everything, went wrong during this trip. And I, I, I was sent there to paint these murals on the walls of the house. I, I never got to paint the murals. Uh, and a lot of turmoil sort of festered within the house, within my emotional state and the things that were going on uh, at that time. So, I was sitting in the house in all of this sort of turmoil, but what was outside of me in the house was such beauty, such extreme beauty. Uh, Ireland is full of just green, lush land. And the house that I was staying in, uh, this was the view out back. It was an overgrown backyard, overgrown with blackberries and grass and weeds and the whole thing. And to me, it was this fantastic, beautiful scene. I mean, it looked like, they all looked like Rembrandt paintings. Everywhere you turned around and looked, it was, there were Rembrandt paintings. And, I, and, and when I got there, I was blocked for almost a solid month. The first month that I was there, I was there for three months. But the first solid month I was there was pretty much blocked because I couldn't paint anything. <laughs> because I couldn't, I felt I couldn't live up to the nature, the beauty of nature that was standing before me, you know, but uh, so overgrown was was an, an attempt to sort of express uh, a bit of a the inner turmoil that was going on in me, but also 
the outside beauty. I mean, the sheer outside beauty. I, the, the, the yard looked like a mess, but to me, it was a beautiful mess. It was a sublime mess. I, I couldn't believe it. And it was floor to ceiling windows out the backyard. So this was just your view every day when you, when you woke up in the kitchen. This was sort of the kitchen view. Um, can you go to the next slide? So this is Rose Cottage. I call this Rose Cottage. So while I was there, I was uh, determined to paint all the things around me and to let out everything that was going on in my mind into the paintings that were wanted to come out, but they had to be of things that were there. They had to be part of what I was seeing, right? So it was the backyard. It was a, I did another one of the weather vane on the upstairs part of the house. And this was of a rose on the side of the house and it's called Rose Cottage. And uh, it, it sort of depicts a lot of that obvious turmoil that was kind of coming out of me at the time. But I realized when I got home that, uh, and mind you, the name of the house I was staying in was called Rose Cottage, which to me was just completely poetic. Um, but uh, when I got home, I realized that uh, in reality, Rose Cottage was a metaphor for that imaginary safe place that only exists in your mind. You know, no matter where you go, there you are, they, they always say. So um, it's, it's been a bit of an exploration of that for me. So um, thank you very much. Um, this, uh, I'm very glad I was able to share my work with you guys. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Lazarus. They are some beautiful, beautiful pieces of work. I'm getting some, just reading some of the comments in our YouTube chat. They're telling me that a lot of people really appreciate the beauty in your work. So thank you. Oh, so much. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, 